is rice, Boy said, holding out a bowl of something. Rice, one presumes. I know what rice is, Zappa, the prisoner said. Hey, did you just say, I know what rice is, Zappa? And you said, it's rice in Spanish. Your meat man made you give up your old throats then. I don't really know, but I can hear you. What do you say? I'm speaking Sparish. It's old cosmic magic. But I'm not thinking any different. I'm just saying things in Tindral, ain't I? I don't know what you're saying, only what I'm hearing. But the silent stones work on your ears as well. Gotta go your whole life without being captured to know what the real world sounds like. Not your first time being captured then. Didn't purge my old throat by choice, did I? I don't know. You seem pretty different to what I thought. What did you think, Zappa? Thought you'd be all grunting and bleeding and blinding and, you know, monster stuff. All Zappas think that. What's a Zappa, then? The prisoner pointed at Boy. All right, should have known, shouldn't I? Never heard that. Sheltered like nothing else. Surprised you ever left a flat cave. What? I think this throat thing's still getting used to things, but... Bits know the sum of it. I don't know what you've been up to, but I got some questions for you. What's the name, for starters? Comariero. The Wall. Right. I'm Boy. The Child. Don't you start. It's a long story. It seems the Cosmic People magic allowed Boy and Comariero there to get chatting with Boy eager to find out what trouble they could expect from the Tranca Union. Comariero spilled the beans without much pressuring, telling of a village a couple of days' walk east in the lowlands. You seem like a reasonable bloke. Why were you coming at us like that? Boy asked. If you really are from another world, what use would there be explaining it? I failed, so my story ends. There will be no ill will if you kill me, Zapper Boy. In fact, if your kindness extends that far, I request it. Hold your horseshoes. You know what I want here, don't you? Your mates are going to kill us any day now. If you get the heat off us, we can make a deal and you'll go free, right? Comariero hung his head and said nothing, even after a few more questions from Boy. Then there was a tumbling sound from the shed next door, followed rapidly by Lady thrusting her head into the doorway. Boy, quickly! You have to hear this, she said, disappearing again before any reply could be given. Think carefully, man, Boy said in parting to the prisoner, bolting the door closed as he moved over to the staves shed. There he saw the setup mentioned previously, with the handle piped into a strange cosmic rod. Staves was holding said rod with trembling hands. It's in here, he managed to say to Boy. You what? Just listen, Boy. Lady said, getting to work on the handle. The thing began cycling through the same series of strange noises as before. What am I listening to here? Boy asked. Wait! Lady barked. The noises carried on until the all-important one. Hello! If you speak one bastion, please reply, yes. Yeah? What's it to you? Boy replied. You have selected one bastion. Fantastic! the rod said. Staves fell to the ground and clasped his hands together. Lady closed her eyes and kept pushing away on the generator handle. What are you doing? Boy asked of them. It's the Overlord, isn't it? Lady said. Overlord? That sounds like a wonk to me. You think the Overlord isn't a wonk? Oh, when you put it like that. Uh... Boy was cut off by the rod beginning to speak again. Data files found. One bastion. Ha! Blasted old language, that. You must be a proper bunch of outcasts then, eh? I haven't heard those effing and essing chaps since my old grandfather's portfolio. What a time it must have been. Oh my, I'm getting off topic. You see... Are you the Overlord? Boy asked, but the voice didn't react, carrying on as before. Not really a better way to understand it, so forgive the technicalities. I suppose it's not impossible that you'll still remember silence. Well, maybe not, or they wouldn't even broadcast this message. What? Oh, uh, fine, I'll get on with it. 
Sorry, just a blast from the past with one bastion. It's rather fun to speak, you know. I know, I know. Well, they won't know that, will they? Blast it. Right, hello again. Apologies. If you could hear this message, you are almost certainly going to die. But that's where I come in. This message is an automated broadcast from your planet's emergency exit strategy center. And clearly, the emergency has been declared. So, if you get this, you need to get over here and get your hands in. You might not have much time, so don't dally about it. You will find your radio will detect positioning data from the launch site, which you can use, along with your own local maps, to navigate to the relevant point. Bloody Garfield, I hope you one bastion nuts still know about radios. That's all I know, really. You probably know more about it than me, don't you? Whatever apocalypse is going on there, I do wish you the best of luck. And as I said, we're waiting for you to evacuate. There's always another Rimworld, as they say. <laughs> oh, I feel terrible for all this. That's it then, isn't it? What's next then? Frentalian? No one in the bloody blasted universe still speaks Frentalian. What? Ah, I keep forgetting the button. And there you go. That's what the Almighty had to say. You might be a little confused, but spare a thought for poor Staves, boy and lady, who were entirely convinced that the master of the universe had just said all that guff. But it wasn't all lost on them. Bits spoke of a Hellocat, didn't it? It was telling us to go somewhere and find it! Boy reasoned after a long silence indicated no more would be said. Yeah, it said to go somewhere because of danger, Lady confirmed. She was still spinning the handle, just to be sure. I knew it! I knew it! Griffin must have heard it too, somehow! That's what's all going on here, isn't it? Boy said, jumping around the shed. What are we supposed to do, though? What it said! We have to save pieces! Pieces? I thought it meant this world. Why would it mean that? And it's all the same, isn't it, if there's a Hillocat here? This is part of the pieces! Right, what did it say? You got it, didn't you, lady? Yeah, it said... You'll find your radio will detect positioning data from the launch site. What's a radio? No idea. Positioning data? Like using the sun to get course or something. And a launch site. A catapult? Bloody bits, we need a priest here, don't we? Wonk, get up! Boy shouted, pulling Staves up from his knees. What's all this about? Tell us! Forbidden magic? He whispered. It's the Overlord, this ain't forbidden magic. Yes it is. Radio. Radio's an old word. I think it's this. Staves picked up the cosmic rod and looked it over. Yes, it actually was a radio, as Staves was recalling. He'd read of certain mystical machines from times long gone, and the machine that read words aloud by magic must have been something like this rod. And more than that, it was a direction finder for soon-to-be-dead colonists. But that titbit hadn't made it into Castle Griffin's black box of forbidden tomes. The rod didn't say anything else after that, no matter how much sweat was seeped at the magic handle. All it would do was beep occasionally and display readouts on its glass panels. According to Staves, it was just a series of numbers and letters with no meaning which did wonders for building anxiety over a purported end of the world sneaking up on them. Lady reassured herself by memorizing the numbers, Boy reassured himself by getting as many crops stowed away as possible, and Staves preferred to share Cannibal's view on the matter, to leave pesky things like the apocalypse until after dinner. Really, things carried on quite well, but this awareness that the Almighty was up to something made even the smallest inconvenience seem like the beginning of the end. For example, when a frothing raccoon hissed at staves, beginning of the end, or when Comeriero became quite ill and didn't want to spill any beans other than those his stomach ejected, beginning of the end, perhaps. Or when there was a huge, slow solar eclipse, turning day to night for a good 50 hours. Well okay, this is starting to sound like the beginning of the end, I will admit, but for a well-stocked enclave like Three Up Fort, it was all just bumps in the road. No, on Reticot, 
The real end came when someone decided to kill you, which happened about five days after the Cosmic Rod revelation. Coincidence? No, actually. Well, well, it's my lucky day, a strange woman said at the door of the barn. She was entering a shack that stunk of vomit, and were it not for the stifling darkness of midday under the eclipse, she'd have seen a nude, grimacing man, stained with the remains of a half-dozen rejected bowls of boiled rice. It's always nice when the primitives start playing with radios, the woman said, squeezing through the door and holding her nose. We can all listen in, darling. Orbital locked onto you right away. They said you weren't worth it, but here you are. A slave freshly fallen from a tree. <laughs> now let's get you wrapped up. The woman began tying a length of cloth around Comariero's mouth. But then there was a pattering at the door. Even the smell of the vom, stewed by the heat of fading summer, was not enough to fool the sniffer of Cannibal. She smelled a large woman with a metal helmet, charwood chestplate, and stained leather suit. And sure enough, here she was. With a single bark, Staves was in the doorway too, with rifle in hand. Bloody mats! I thought you lot ate them all! The woman protested. She pulled a length of wood from her coat with something metal gleaming on the end and brandished it. Staves leveled his rifle with his signature kick of the butt, and fired without so much as a blink. The shot clacked into the woman's wooden chestplate. She tried to bring her weapon down on Cannibal, but Cannibal had lunged forward and sunk her teeth into some tasty exposed shins, causing the weapon to fall long. Orbital, help! she called out. Whatever it meant, Staves had already flicked the bolt on the rifle and was pulling the trigger again. The weapon clicked. Staves pulled the bolt back again, while the woman tried to swing at him with her stick and kick Cannibal away at the same time, causing her to stumble off balance. Peering into the thunder hole, Staves saw no more of the shiny brass tubes that the bolt action usually moved around inside the thing. But thanks to the wisdom of the tribes, he knew precisely what to do. Taking a step back, he pulled the rifle back over his shoulder, then flung it full pelt into the woman's face. A bolt-action rifle weighs at least 5 kilos, so to us we might imagine having a couple of bottles of your favourite brand of cola slam into our faces at once. More than enough to have this intruder crashing to the ground. Cannibal kept her teeth in place as Staves put a foot on her chest. If I leave you alive, will you tell us stuff? He asked. I'll tell you now, primitive, that Orbital's gonna make you regret the day you were born! Is that all you'll tell us? Shut up! You can make me your slave, but the Eaters will rescue me sooner or later. Right. One moment. Staves carefully unbuttoned a chest pocket, difficult in the dark, and slid out a black box. He whacked his fist on the side of the rifle magazine until it thudded into the mud, then clicked the box into place. Wait, hang on, the woman said as Staves put the rifle in her face. He pulled the trigger, but it just clicked. Oh, sorry, he said. He pulled the bolt action back, peering into the hole to watch a thunder tube get hooked up into the barrel. Sliding the action forward pushed it in front of the clicking pin. Not the usual ceremony, but sure enough, when Staves pulled the trigger this time, it made short work of the woman's neck. She stopped struggling, although Cannibal kept angrily gnawing at her shin. It was then that Boy once again arrived on the scene to find Staves dusting his hands of another murder. Staves quickly told Boy, She already said everything she knew. What in the pits is going on? Who's that? Boy asked. Good question. She was talking to a god called Orbital, and she said her friends are going to kill us later. That's all. Doesn't sound like bloody all, does it? Well, it is, Staves insisted, pointing at the rancid mess of assorted bodily fluids on the floor. Glad I didn't get to live in that hollow-shadowed castle in the end, Boy muttered to himself, stepping over to Comariero and pulling him away from the worst of it. Pirates, Comariero managed to say. What's that? Boy asked. Eaters. She is a pirate. Worst of the Zappers. Kote warriors. Kote. With this, his words turned into groans instead. 
Come on, clearly this ain't no place for anyone, Boy said, hauling Comariero onto his shoulders with surprising ease, and carefully treading around the mess to escape. Staves whistled to Cannibal, and she finally let go of the dared attacker. The dead pirate, apparently. Walk his time then, he said, at once flipping Cannibal's mood. Meanwhile, Boy took Comariero to the main hall. It was lighter inside than outside, on account of a blowwork fireball placed on a plastic stand in the middle of the room, with pipes running out to a stocky metal windmill beside the door. This experimental machination was the start of something more impressive than this generally still quite depressing scene, but we'll return to that later. The light helped Boy tie Comariero to the wall, leaving various cleaning implements for him in reach. Then he busied himself in the kitchen and returned with a bowl of dry mashed potatoes. It was no fun to eat, but unlike that slippery rice, it didn't bounce off Comariero's stomach. So, sorry about all that, Boy eventually said, sitting at a table across the room from the prisoner. Such are the times, Comariero said. Don't mind me asking, but was my, uh, workmate, you know, the fat guy, was what he was saying correct? She is an eater of gore, was. Pirates from the cosmos who walk among us. Pirates of what? They're much to take here. Lives. They are agents of the Cote. Yeah, about that. Not the first time I've heard that word. You know it. Of course. It is the end. It is a word from before the Zappas. It means roll up. Like the beginning made retocot, the end returns it to the wheel. Death ceases to matter. Comariero now tilted over and lay on the floor, holding his stomach. Boy felt like he could do the same when he realized what was happening. The locals of Reticot were already clued in about the world ending, and the Overlord had told the crew the same thing. There was no denying that everyone was in big trouble now. As it happened, they were in big trouble whether either religious prophecy had any merit or not. As on a rim world, it's pretty much always one loose wire away from apocalypse. Is there any way to stop it? Boy eventually asked. Comariero shook his head in reply. What if there's a way to escape? Boy fished. Go to the cosmos. The Eaters of Gore will take you. As a slave. To Orbital. The Endless Hell, Comariero said, smiling for some reason. What's that Orbital? A god, is it? A punishment. They will take you there one day. I doubt that. Our madman will kill them all given half the chance. You can believe that will save you. But the Cote already started. Zappers will die first. Zappers and whatever you are. Cheerful, aren't you? I've made my mark. What's that mean? Means you are wasting your time giving me your mud nuggets. Mud nuggets? You call them mud nuggets? That is what they are. You better hope these egg magic things are translating that wrong. You sound like a right muppet. What's a muppet? Uh, I don't know. It's your language. Don't ask me what the words mean. I'm just saying them somehow. It all twists up in the end, Comariero said with another smile. Right. Well, got more mud nuggets to mash, Boy said, getting back to work. All this transpired on the first day of Reticot's autumn season. Just as a reminder, the planet's years were only 60 days long, engineered thousands of quote-unquote years ago to maximize the productivity of the carefully crafted ecosystem. This was all perfectly normal to the gang, as Pieces was designed in the same fashion, not that they understood it on that level. It meant that Boy and Lady could act on autopilot, carrying out harvests, collecting useful plants and firewood, and sizing up the angle of the sun to guess what winter climate they'd be getting. Meanwhile, Staves was convinced to clean the barn, for cannibal's sake, then got back to work in the good old shed. Now said shed was starting to get a bit chilly of a morning with the fading of summer. 
while on the other hand, the larder at the mountain's edge was getting too hot under its corrugated steel roof, causing Boy's precious corn to decompose. The prospect of freezing and slash or starving was nothing new to the residents of rural Tindra, and usually one relied upon a burning passion for the overlord and a sustaining regimen of prayer to get through it. But the cosmic people magic offered a different solution. Three Up Fort was just a little more wonkery away from a few mod cons. The world might be ending by roll up or by the bits, but the blowwork revolution was gonna make it a far more pleasant experience. <laughs>